Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to this month's um, research and practice seminar, the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society's Research and Practice Seminar. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, this month, we, um, I'm Renee Formiati, I'm a research officer at Arches, um, and I'd like to welcome this month, we have Dr. Bianca Philiborn, who is a lecturer in criminology at the University of Melbourne. She's currently an ARC DECRA fellow, and her project, project examines victim-centred justice responses to street harassment in Australia. Dr. Philiborn's recent research is focused on the intersections of sexual and gender-based violence, space and place, identity and culture, um, Bianca is also the author of Reclaiming the Nighttime Economy, Unwanted Sexual Attention in Licensed Venues, and is co-editor of Me Too and the Politics of Social Change. Um, today we had Bianca talking about sexual violence and safety at Australian music festivals, and I'm going to hand over to you now. And we'll have some questions at the end, I should say. Great, thanks so much, Renee, and thank you so much um, to Renee and to Arches for inviting me to come and present uh, this webinar today. Um, I think it was um, originally going to be a face-to-face -face seminar when we first started um, discussing um, this, this event, um, and of course COVID happened, but I'm very happy um, to be joining you all online. Um, so I'd also like to start with an, an acknowledgement to country. So I'm joining you today uh, from the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and uh, to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Okay, so as Renee mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to you today about uh, a collaborative project that I've been working on over the past few years, looking at sexual violence and safety at Australian music festivals. Uh, and I should also acknowledge it feels very strange to be talking about music festivals in the current context where you know, the idea of going out to see live music and standing in a crowd with other people feels like a very distant uh, memory. Um, so just a brief overview, I'll talk you through um, the study background and methods. Uh, I am going to have a, a bit of a snapshot look at what we found uh, in relation to safety and perceptions of sexual violence uh, and a snapshot of participants' experiences of sexual violence um, before I move on to look a bit more specifically about what, what is it about the festival setting uh, that might be facilitating um, sexual violence? So how do the festival culture and environment um, produce a setting that is conducive to sexual violence? Uh, and I'm going to argue that we can use this concept of assemblage to understand uh, how sexual violence unfolds uh, in festival settings. Um, so I should also make a content warning. So quite clearly this um, presentation is going to touch on um, sexual violence in quite a bit of detail, um, although I don't think there's any um, particularly explicit examples that I'll go into, uh, but certainly I will be providing some um, broad uh, examples of the types of violence that our participants experienced. So as I said, this was a collaborative project and I do want to acknowledge um, my um, two collaborators, Dr. Philip Wads from UNSW and Professor Stephen Thompson from Western Sydney University. Uh, I should also thank the Falls Festival who um, partnered with us on this project. Okay, so how did this uh, research project come to be? Um, so a few years ago, we'd started to notice that there was increased um, media reporting and anecdotal evidence that um, sexual violence and sexual harassment seemed to be uh, occurring and to be a significant issue at um, music festivals both within, within Australia uh, and, and internationally. Um, so in particular, there were some very high profile incidents that had happened at um, the Falls Festival in Tasmania um, and as at, at Laneway Festival um, as well. And we started to see some responses being put in place, like a hotline at Laneway and some grassroots uh, activism uh, or activist responses. Uh, however, we did a bit of initial scoping um, research 
and found that there was actually no research um, that specifically looked at sexual violence um, at or in music festival settings, uh, although there is certainly uh, a lot of analogous um, research um, or closely related research on issues like drug and alcohol use at festivals, um, sexual health and public health promotion, uh, and of course sociological work looking at the significance and, and meanings assigned um, to festivals. Uh, and of course there is some work on sexual violence in other kind of party and venue and live music settings. Uh, however, we would suggest that there are aspects of music festivals that are quite distinct and that require um, examination <clears throat> in their own right. Um, so most obviously the size or the scale of music festivals uh, is quite different to those other settings uh, and they also tend to be quite um, temporary and, and fluid spaces. Um, so we decided to address this gap with our, our pilot project uh, that started in I think 2017. Uh, although there have also been some very similar projects developed in the UK at almost exactly the same time, um, particularly a project led by uh, Dr Hannah Bose. So what did we do? Um, so this project had three kind of key components to it. Um, so the first was an online survey uh, that we did with um, attendees at the Byron Bay Falls Festival uh, in 2018 to 2019. Um, the second was on-site observation. Um, so very, very challenging uh, research process, as you can imagine. Um, Phil and I had the pleasure of actually attending um, the Byron Bay Falls Festival um, as a type of immersive um, observational and, and ethnographic uh, aspect to the project. Uh, and finally, we also did some one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, victim survivors who'd experienced sexual violence at any Australian music festival. Um, so that wasn't limited to the Falls uh, Festival. Uh, and we spoke to 14 victim survivors and two individuals who had been involved in responding to incidents at festivals. Uh, so just for a really quick snapshot of our participants, um, so for the survey, um, I mean the main things I just want to draw attention to here is that our sample were overwhelmingly cisgender uh, men and women. We had very few um, trans, non-binary, gender diverse people taking part uh, and some people in the survey actually made comments that were very hostile towards um, trans people in particular. Um, again, the sample was uh, predominantly heterosexual, um, although we did have a, a, a relatively okay spread of um, LGBT, uh, or sorry, LGB participants, not the T, um, but still predominantly a cisgender heterosexual uh, sample, and also quite a, a young sample. Um, so although the sample range from 17 to 56 um, years of age. Most people were in their kind of early 20s and, and late teens. Uh, in relation to our interview participants, I think um, surprisingly they were almost all women. Um, certainly everyone who discussed firsthand experiences of sexual violence uh, was a woman. Uh, and we had two men, uh, one who participated as a respondent to sexual violence and the other who uh, was discussing things that he'd uh, witnessed and, and intervened in at festivals. Uh, again, um, this sample was overwhelmingly heterosexual uh, and the two participants who identified as bi-curious were discussing experiences that had happened in a, a more heteronormative uh, context. Uh, and we did see a much wider spread of age for the interview participants. Uh, okay, so before I move on to look at um, some of the findings from the project, I just wanted to um, give a brief overview of some of the key um, theories and concepts that underpinned the work uh, and that I'll, I'll be drawing on in developing some of our analysis and arguments in this presentation. Um, so firstly, in terms of how we understood what sexual violence is, uh, we were drawing on Liz Kelly's continuum model of sexual violence. Um, so this model uh, views all forms of sexual violence as being um, interconnected, regardless of how uh, seemingly minor or, or trivial um, they might be. So it draws together the mundane and everyday with the more um, stereotypically um, serious forms of, of sexual violence and recognises that um, they're all underpinned by the same systems of power uh, and gendered inequality. Uh, and that they all remove um, survivors' ability to control um, 
how they engage in sexual interactions. Uh, this approach is also very survivor centered, so it's not concerned with any particular legal um, definition of what sexual violence is. It's about what the um, individual interpreted as being sexual violence, either at the time or later. Uh, but we do also draw on an intersectional um, framework, so the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, so certainly we do view sexual violence as a product of gendered inequality, uh, but we also recognise that gender is co-constituted and entangled with other axes of identity, um, such as race, sexuality, um, ableism and so forth. Um, so these different kind of categories of identity can't be reduced to the sum of their parts. And we certainly don't claim to speak coherently of any kind of essential um, or universal category of woman or, or universal experience of sexual violence. Um, so the second really key concept that we're drawing on is um, Bakhtin's work on carnival. Um, so we're drawing on this to um, conceptualise festivals as uh, carnivalesque spaces. Uh, and we're certainly not alone um, in using this framework in conceptualising um, festivals of, of various um, different kinds, um, including music festivals. Uh, so very briefly, carnival can be thought of uh, as this time outside of time where the normal rules that might govern our behaviours and our actions are transgressed and, and mocked and subverted. Um, so it's a, a temporary um, freeing uh, from the kind of routines and norms of our everyday lives. Um, so carnival is really uh, characterised by excess, uh, so particularly excess consumption of you know, food, alcohol, etc., uh, and also on bodily or, or corporal pleasures. Uh, however, the, the temporary nature of carnival is, is really key here. Um, so even though this is a time where uh, norms are, are subverted, um, it ultimately acts to reinforce normative rules and hierarchies because we return to these um, at the end of this time outside of time. So it's a very bounded uh, form of, of transgression. Um, so we also draw on Mike Presti's work uh, around carnival and cultural criminology. Um, so Presti argued that the conditions of late consumer capitalism, um, so with its attendant structural inequalities, um, this drive for perpetual consumption, uh, the marginalisation and disenfranchisement, um, of particular groups uh, driving a greater appetite or desire to engage uh, in acts of, of carnival in uh, contemporary life. So there's this idea that carnival is something that is always with us or that we're always um, actively sort of seeking out. Uh, and I'm going to return to this concept in a moment to think through the extent to which festivals might be carnivalesque spaces uh, or not uh, and the role that this plays in uh, sexual violence. So the third kind of conceptual framework that we're drawing on, um, quite loosely, there's going to be some purists out there around um, Deleuze and Guattari and, and post-humanism who might be yelling at me th through the screen. Um, but we're drawing on firstly Deleuze and Guattari's concept of assemblage, um, but more broadly on post-humanist and um, critical materialist thought. Um, so we're drawing on this approach because we feel that it helps to avoid reduce sexual violence to singular categories of causation. Um, so instead, we're viewing sexual violence as being situated within the complex and fluid interplay between um, the material and non-human, uh, human and discursive features of festivals. Um, so we view these different elements as being um, intimately entangled in very fluid and emergent ways. Um, and as relating to each other in a radically non-hierarchical way, so we're not suggesting that any one of these factors is necessarily um, you know, more important than another. Um, so importantly, this position really goes beyond viewing space and non-human elements as um, passive, uh, passive backdrops that human behaviour just takes place on. Um, instead, we're viewing these non-human elements as agentic and as something that needs to be taken seriously in accounting for perpetration of sexual violence. Um, at the same time, without falling into the essentialist trap of saying that the material environment is directly um, causing or determining the actions of, of perpetrators in a really simplistic and straightforward way. 
um, and we're using this, um, this framework to make sense of individual incidents um, that were discussed by participants. So we view it more as a kind of micro level account of sexual violence uh, and as something that's working alongside more macro level um, theories of sexual violence that are focused more on those um, structural causes and, and power relations. Okay, so back to this idea of um, festivals as uh, carnivalesque spaces. Um, so certainly I think festivals can be um, thought of as an example of carnival. So as this time outside of time where the subversion of the norms and rules of everyday life um, is apparent. So these are certainly spaces where transgressive behaviours can be engaged in uh, relatively openly. Um, and I think they're also quite expressive and playful spaces uh, in ways that are perhaps less possible in kind of normal or, or everyday life. Um, and we see this manifest in a whole uh, range of, of different ways. Um, so for example, clothing, and we've included, uh, I've included some photos here of um, examples of kind of festival fashion. So we might see things like the use of um, costumes and, and cosplay um, and quite fantastical uh, or theatrical dress, um, although I think as some of these images illustrate, um, this dress can still be highly gendered and, and normative in particular ways. Um, secondly, is drug and alcohol consumption. So certainly festivals are well documented as being spaces um, marked by um, excessive consumption. Um, so we can think of them as carnivalesque spaces in terms of how much um, people are being con people are consuming, uh, as well as what is being consumed. So, for example, festivals might be a time where um, people are, are taking substances uh, that they perhaps otherwise wouldn't. Um, but we can also think of them as carnivalesque in terms of how people are doing this consumption. Um, so during our observations at the Falls Festival, for example, we saw um, people sculling beer while doing handstands um, or you know, doing shoeies when you skull beer out of a, out of a shoe. Um, so I think there's very particular rituals of consumption in these spaces and forms of consumption that are quite um, playful and, and performance. So there's a kind of performativity of, of hedonism. Uh, finally, I think we also see um, aspects of carnival through um, the possibilities for sexual expression and exploration. Um, so festivals are um, spaces where you might be able to openly pick up um, and look for sexual uh, interactions. Although I think this is arguably similar to some other kind of play and, and leisure settings such as licensed venues. Um, we also suggest that festivals can be viewed as carnivalesque um, in the face of the kind of increasing hyper-regulation of nightlife. So you know, we've seen things like the um, lockout laws that were introduced in Sydney in, in particular. Um, so festivals were kind of increasingly being positioned as um, an unregulated uh, space where people could engage more freely in, in playful and transgressive um, behaviours. Uh, that said, we also argue that the carnivalesque nature of festivals is actually very limited at best. Um, and it's actually questionable as to whether they're truly transgressive or carnivalesque spaces at all, uh, at, at least in certain contexts. So carnival is already a temporary subversion of the usual order, but it's not clear that this even occurs at festivals um, and particularly in relation to sexual violence uh, as we'll, we'll cover in a moment. Um, but we see this manifest through a whole range of, of other uh, examples. So I think the very heavy policing presence would be the most obvious. Um, so these are in fact sites that are, are quite heavily regulated through um, the criminal justice system, particularly in relation to the use of um, illicit drugs. Um, but they're also monitored and surveilled by a range of other actors, such as private security, um, event staff, uh, and so on. Uh, and they're, of course, um, sub subject to a range of uh, legal regulation. We also see this manifest in uh, other more normative ways. So uh, gendered norms are still very apparent in these spaces, uh, as we just saw on the previous slide. And um, that's something that I'll unpack in a bit more detail in a moment. 
uh, we also see this through the, you know, the logics of consumer capitalism being very apparent um, within these spaces, uh, something that's been argued by Anderton. Okay, so before I move on to look more at um, experiences of sexual violence and how this was being facilitated in uh, a festival setting, I just wanted to provide a bit of a brief snapshot of our um, survey findings for a bit of general context. So the survey was looking at um, participants' perceptions of safety and their perceptions of um, sexual and other forms of violence. Um, so it wasn't asking people about their direct or first-hand experiences. Um, so what did we find? Uh, so firstly, most people felt safe either um, usually or always at, at festivals. So people felt safe most of the time. Uh, and it's important to note, firstly, that that included um, interview participants who'd experienced sexual violence. They also um, commented that they still usually felt safe at, at festivals. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge um, given the ongoing kind of moral panic around festivals, again, particularly in relation to drug use, um, but I think they are constructed as a space that is, is unsafe and that's not what was reflected um, in our survey. That said, even though most people felt safe most of the time, there were a um, smaller number of participants who either never, rarely, or sometimes uh, felt safe. And for those participants, they were almost exclusively women or um, L L LGBTQ plus participants. Um, so I think unsurprisingly, straight cisgender men reported the highest um, perceptions of safety, um, although we do need to read that alongside the potential um, of that being a performance of, of masculinity. Um, so safety was um, associated with factors like being with friends, um, having good lighting uh, and crowds, um, and the presence of security and police. Um, but these factors also acted in quite contradictory ways, and they didn't always align with um, what our survivors spoke about. So, for example, while crowds could make people feel safe, there was a very fine line between it being crowded and overcrowded, and overcrowding was something that made people feel unsafe. Uh, likewise, policing and security were certainly not always uh, experienced as safe, and they were sometimes, uh, in fact, the direct or overt cause of uh, unsafety. Um, so just really briefly, the majority of our participants thought that physical violence and sexual harassment and assault occur at festivals, uh, and they were viewed as being quite common, particularly sexual harassment. Uh, participants were much less certain about uh, homophobic or um, transphobic violence. And I, again, I think that's unsurprising given uh, the sample that we had um, uh, in our survey. Uh, we also felt during our observations that these were quite visibly uh, heteronormative uh, spaces. And I think that's something that requires more explanation or exploration in future research. Uh, interestingly, our survey participants, um, the vast majority, thought that they would be extremely likely to report a sexual assault um, to the police if they experienced this. Uh, and of course, this does not align with the experiences and practices of survivors. Uh, and finally, just to highlight again that kind of hedonistic um, and carnivalesque nature of festivals, um, alcohol and drug consumption was incredibly common uh, among our sample. So almost everyone consumed alcohol and almost all of those people were consuming at what might be considered um, high risk levels. Um, and just under half of our participants said that they consumed other drugs. So that included illicit substances, uh, but also the use of um, prescription medicines for non-prescribed reasons. Uh, and around a third of the sample also um, talked about uh, engaging in poly drug use. Okay, now just a quick snapshot of our um, interview participants uh, and the types of uh, things that they, they commonly uh, experienced. So uh, as I said, interview participants were asked about their firsthand experiences of sexual violence um, at, at festivals. Uh, and notably, firstly, almost all of our participants had multiple experiences of sexual violence and harassment across um, different types of festivals. Um, so it's really important to acknowledge that, that this is not an issue um, or a problem that is unique to any one individual um, festival setting or, or festival type. Um, so the types of experiences that our participants discussed really um, spanned that continuum of sexual violence. 
Um, so they range from things that might be dismissed as you know, kind of normal or, or trivial, um, all the way through to experiences that would meet um, or would be likely to meet legal thresholds of, of harm, so indecent assaults um, and, and digital rape. Um, so some of the more common experiences are, are listed on the slide here, and certainly things like uh, the kind of groping uh, and grabbing in the mosh pit was one of the most common experiences, um, as was uh, sexualized verbal commentary and verbal harassment. Um, and like I said, most participants had multiple experiences of harassment across um, different festivals, and a lot of our participants understood the harms of their experience as being the result of these repeated kind of cumulative occurrences of like smaller things as opposed to having had one kind of big um, stereotypically serious form of, um, of sexual violence happen. Um, and I think that this is really illustrated nicely by the comments by Elsie and um, and Casey on the slide. So for Elsie, um, you know, she hadn't had any kind of particularly violent experience. It was more the low-lying experience of being harassed and groped at, you know, virtually every festival she'd ever been to. Um, and Casey says something similar, um, that it's just a collective and this cumulative effect of experiences uh, again and again and again uh, over time. So who was perpetrating this stuff? Um, I think unsurprisingly, and in line with what we know about sexual violence more broadly, uh, it was overwhelmingly men who were perpetrating this behavior, but not exclusively. And again, I think that's really important to acknowledge that some people did talk about, uh, particularly forms of sexual harassment that were being perpetrated by women at festivals. Um, most commonly, these incidents were being uh, perpetrated by um, strangers, particularly unknown men in crowded areas of festivals. Um, but participants also talked about harassment and violence that was perpetrated by security guards and by acquaintances. Um, so this is really at odds with what we know about sexual violence more broadly, uh, which is usually perpetrated by someone who is known to the victim survivor. Um, so we're not sure why this was the case in our project. It could be something about the festival setting um, and the mass gathering nature that meant that sexual violence perpetrated by strangers was more common. Um, it could have also been how participants understood what counted as um, sexual violence in a festival setting and that um, violence perpetrated by partners or known people wasn't understood as being about festivals um, per se. Uh, people discussed both group and, and individual perpetration. Um, they were both quite common um, and yeah, opportunistic um, perpetration was also very, very common, particularly in those really uh, crowded spaces where there were masses of people. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to look at the different facets of festival culture and the festival uh, environment that came through in our participants' narratives um, as playing a role or as underpinning um, sexual violence that took place at festivals. Um, so I'm gonna have a look at some of the key aspects that were raised uh, and then I'm gonna draw these together to consider how they might form an assemblage of, um, of sexual violence. Um, so the first element that I wanted to discuss was that um, transgressive or carnivalesque nature of, of festivals. Um, so as I said earlier, um, we were drawing on Bakhtin's um, concept of carnival, um, and certainly to some extent we can view festivals as sites of transgression and carnival, uh, where the routines and structures of everyday life are being subverted and, and challenged, um, although in quite limited and very gendered ways. So this is something that really came out in our, our participants' narratives um, as well. So for example, the quotes from, uh, from Nerida here, Sorry, I have a cat that's just come in and is meowing at me. Sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> um, sorry, Nerida was talking about how at festivals, you know, you can get a bit looser, particularly um, compared to, um, you know, a normal night out. And I think this is quite um, evocative. Um, you know, it does suggest that there's kind of room to move around the norms um, of everyday life or some kind of flexibility or space at the boundaries here. Um, 
her second quote also speaks to this kind of bounded and immersive nature of festivals. So that time outside of time, um, particularly for camping festivals where, you know, you're away for um, two or three days in often quite secluded spaces and you're quite disconnected from you know, like the everyday world. Um, and then as she says, you come out and you're back to the real world. Um, so this idea of carnival also came through in practices like dress, um, as we gave some examples of uh, earlier. Um, however, we can see in the quote from Anita here how some of these transgressive elements of festivals um, could also be drawn on in excusing and minimising uh, sexual violence. Um, so in, in this case, Anita's saying that um, some of the more, I guess, playful dress that's possible at festivals could also be drawn on by perpetrators who might see women as um, softer targets or feel that they're more able to kind of get away um, with perpetrating against these women. Um, so Nerida, who's also quoted here, um, also had an experience of being harassed um, by a security guard at a festival. Uh, and she went and reported her experience to another guard, a uh, female guard, who said to her, well, uh, quote, um, you know, you should look at what you're wearing. Um, so Nerida was topless at the time and wearing nipple pasties, which I think is arguably quite a normative um, form of dress uh, within the festival context, although it should go without saying that it shouldn't actually matter what she was wearing. I think this also illustrates how festivals are actually um, in fact, not strictly carnivalesque spaces, given that we can see these kind of everyday um, victim blaming norms um, that are still being drawn on here to blame survivors for their own experiences and to excuse the actions of perpetrators. I think Nerida's experience also raises questions around well, who is actually able to experience these as spaces of carnival or spaces of transgression. So for women who had experienced sexual violence, this often contributed to them being excluded from the transgression of festival spaces. So returning to Nerida, she actually changed how she dressed after her experience of harassment and, and victim blaming. Um, so she went and got changed and she felt that she was no longer really able to um, engage in these more transgressive um, practices, which for her had been a real um, attraction and part of the joy of, of going to festivals. Um, a lot of our interview participants also discussed feeling simultaneously inside and outside of festival space. So they were unable to kind of fully immerse themselves in the transgression of festivals. Um, so it wasn't necessarily this time outside of time for them. Uh, I think this was particularly highlighted through the need to be um, hyper vigilant and to engage in safekeeping routines. Um, so one of our participants, Elsie said, and, and this is a quote from Elsie, I spend the whole time at festivals, 90% dancing and talking to friends and 10% like looking around me uh, for keeping myself safe. But also, is anyone getting too close to my friends or is anyone getting too close to the random women I don't know around me? Um, and, you know, that kind of like ripple effect. So even at festivals that I mostly feel safe, I always have a little bit of feeling like I'm kind of alert um, to keep an eye on, on your surroundings. So I think these experiences really challenge the extent to which festivals are actually spaces of um, trans transgression and carnival at all. Uh, and what they suggest is that the same or very similar gendered norms and gendered regimes that are in operation here um, are, are very similar to those in the kind of real world, given that both experiences of sexual violence and the use of these um, safekeeping routines are both mundane and everyday in both settings. Um, so the second um, cultural element that really came through in our participants' accounts uh, was the gendered nature, both of music festivals, but also the music industry more broadly. Um, so again, in contrast to this idea that festivals are particularly transgressive spaces, uh, a lot of our participants also commented that these were very male dominated and masculine spaces. Um, so men often dominated in numbers, um, particularly on the festival lineups, um, as we can see in Elsie's comments, um, but also through masculine coded practices um, that can be more highly valued in these, these spaces. So for example, being able to endure the um, physical intensity of the mosh pit. So this kind of persistent um, 
devaluing of women both in festival spaces and um, the music scene more broadly was really seen as part of the broader cultural backdrop that enabled um, sexual violence in festival and other music settings um, because they contributed towards, uh, uh, again, a broader backdrop of gendered inequality. Um, so I think Jane's quote also highlights how festivals are spaces for um, particular types of masculine performance that involve um, the sexual domination of women. Um, so I think interestingly and kind of paradoxically, her comments suggest that festivals are allowing uh, this kind of underlying component of um, what she terms toxic masculinity to rise up to the surface. So firstly, this does kind of resonate with the idea of carnival in that something that's perhaps not usually um, permitted uh, or on display becomes more possible in festival spaces. Um, but at the same time, I think this type of, of masculine performance reinforces um, very similar um, power structures that we would see in kind of everyday life. Um, and as I mentioned, these norms are not specific just to festival spaces. Um, these are patterns of gendered inequality and the um, devaluation of um, particular ways of doing feminine, femininity and masculinity that we see across the music industry uh, more broadly. Um, although I, at the same time, I don't want to suggest that this is uh, universal or playing out in any um, essentialized kind of way. Um, so I think relatedly, uh, festivals were also seen to be sites of homosocial bonding and spaces where um, groups of men were engaging in performances for other men. Um, so this really resonates with David Grazian's work on um, the concept of the girl hunt, where young men are going out and engaging in um, flirting or sometimes quite aggressive sexual behaviour um, as a way of doing or performing heteronormative masculinity for their friends and for consolidating group bonds and um, reaffirming their status as suitably masculine. Um, so these behaviours have very little to do with the, the women who are the target, their performances um, by and for men. Uh, and this was something that was very um, often commented on in relation to, um, to group perpetration at festivals. Uh, and we can see this in, in Camilla's quote uh, on the slide. Um, so she felt that um, group perpetration in particular was really influenced by you know, what she terms bro culture. So it's you know, groups of guys who are hanging out together who want to kind of one up each other to see who is more manly um, and who can assert their masculinity uh, in order to validate themselves. Okay, so coming back to this idea of the transgressive nature of festival spaces. Um, so this meant that these were often sites of excessive drug and alcohol consumption, um, as we've already seen from our, our survey findings. Uh, but again, this was something that interview participants um, discussed quite commonly uh, as something that played a role in sexual violence unfolding. Um, so Consumption of alcohol and other drugs was certainly seen as playing a role in facilitating or excusing sexual violence. Uh, but I think it's really important to note that this was often viewed in conjunction with other elements of, of festivals. So it wasn't just about um, intoxication. Um, so Helen's quote uh, on the slide really suggests that uh, you know, drug or alcohol use might result in people not knowing where the boundaries are when it comes to perhaps sexual interaction or, um, you know, just generally people's bodily um, and personal boundaries. Um, however, at the same time, she's suggesting that the social and cultural norms that were associated with particular acts or particular genres of music we're more likely to draw a crowd who um, behaved in this way, um, although I am quite cautious about that type of um, interpretation that suggests it's one, one genre of music that's responsible for this behaviour. Nonetheless, that was how Helen um, attributed this. Um, and in turn, this was further facilitated by the crowded spaces of festivals. Um, so not only do we have these individuals who are perhaps less aware of where the boundaries between bodies are, um, the spatial um, arrangement and crowding was quite actively erasing or eliminating um, bodily boundaries or creating this entanglement of bodies in these really crowded areas. 
So I think in Helen's quote, what we can actually see is this kind of folding or um, interplay between the consumption of particular substances with the social and cultural setting, but also the um, material or physical environment. Um, that said, other participants really um, challenged the idea that drugs or alcohol um, provided an excuse um, for perpetration. Um, so Elsie suggests in her quote um, that uh, you know, it's not like these men wouldn't have perpetrated if they weren't intoxicated. Um, so instead, she's suggesting that these men probably would have engaged in um, pr problematic behaviours in any context. It's just that the, the actions would look different. Um, so I think this aspect of her comment is um, suggesting that there's something particular about the festival setting and about drug and alcohol consumption that is um, shaping uh, people's behaviour in, in particular ways. Okay, so uh, finally um, we saw the crowd size and spatial control um, being discussed as playing a clear role in um, creating opportunities for perpetration, uh, as well as shaping how and where bodies can move, um, as I just illustrated. Um, so I really like this quote from Jane, uh, which highlights this point further. So she talks about, you know, being in a really crowded, um, aggressive mosh pit and that there was this sea of patrons that was generating its own force, um, you know, moving patrons' bodies like a wave that causes her to, to fall over. And again, I think there's some quite evocative language here um, around this massive bodies as being kind of agentic or, um, again, having a force that's bigger than the, the sum of its parts. Um, so once she fell over, this created the opportunity for other people in the crowd to, to grope her rather than to, to help her up while she was on the ground and quite helpless. Um, so I feel like this suggests a context in which um, not only is sexual violence normalised and perhaps made, made possible in this context, um, but it also suggests that there's perhaps an absence of an ethics of care um, between patrons in these settings. Uh, so Jackie's quote uh, at the bottom of the slide also highlights how uh, the spatial arrangements of, of festivals could uh, often allow perpetrators to get away with their actions. Um, so the sheer size or scale of festivals and the you know, intensely crowded or packed spaces could make it virtually impossible um, to seek help. Uh, and this meant that perpetrators were um, very unlikely to face uh, consequences for, for their actions. And this is something that came up quite commonly, again, in our um, interview participants' discussions. So, you know, the idea that, well, if you're in this really crowded space, perhaps near the front of the stage, uh, and someone gropes you, you know, by the time that you go and find a security or a member of staff or a volunteer who can do something to help, by the time you get back, you know, you don't know where the perpetrator's gone. Um, a lot of time has passed. There's really nothing um, that can be done about it. Oh, and finally, I did want to mention very, mention very briefly the role of festival policing practices. Um, so this came through um, more so in relation to re reporting or decisions to report um, sexual violence after the fact, as opposed to something that was causing sexual violence to happen. Um, but I did feel that this was quite important to raise, given um, the focus on um, policing at festivals, particularly in relation to drugs. Um, so certainly for our participants, there was a very strong perception that um, police at festivals were really just there to look at drugs and other contraband, um, so that they were there to police the boundaries of the festival and to make sure that these substances or goods didn't get in. Um, but they didn't necessarily care about the safety and well-being of um, patrons once they were actually inside um, the festival. Um, so this also created a very kind of hostile us versus them relationship with the, the police, um, which I think Penny puts it really nicely when she says it created a dissidence of, of trust. So there was this idea um, that's elaborated on in the quote from Anita that um, the police aren't really here for us, they're here to look for um, particular substances. Um, they don't necessarily care if someone's just you know, felt me up in, in the mosh pit. Um, so that was a real barrier to reporting. Um, and I think it needs to be acknowledged as, again, part of this kind of broader broader backdrop that means that um, perpetrators are very likely 
um, very unlikely, sorry, to, to face any kind of consequences for their actions in this setting. Okay, so um, how am I going for time? Okay, not too bad. So in the last kind of 10 minutes or so, I wanted to draw this all together um, by looking at a case study from one of our interview participants that I think illustrates how a lot of these different elements came together um, to form an assemblage of sexual violence. Um, so I'm going to draw on an experience that was shared by um, Camilla. Um, so she actually discussed multiple incidents of sexual violence that had happened at different festivals, um, but I'm just going to look at one uh, in particular here. So Camilla was at a camping festival with her friends. It was a festival that ran over several days and, and nights. Um, and Camilla described herself as someone who feels often um, quite overwhelmed and overstimulated in really crowded environments and environments that have kind of lots of light and noise and um, sensory inputs. So she um, was feeling overwhelmed um, earlier in the night. So she'd been around the main kind of stage area of the festival, um, felt overwhelmed and decided that she needed to retreat back to her campsite and her tent to kind of re recoup and uh, recover. So one of her friends walked her back um, to their campsite, uh, but then returned back to the main stage area to keep watching bands and to keep you know, partying and having drinks with their friends. So Camilla had started drifting off to sleep when she heard someone rustling around, uh, moving around in her tent and going through bags. Uh, and initially she just assumed it was, you know, one of her friends had come back to the tent because they'd forgotten uh, something. Um, however, after a few minutes, she realized that it actually wasn't one of her friends and it was a very intoxicated uh, male stranger who'd come into her tent. Uh, so Camilla confronted him and asked him what he was doing in there and said, you know, this, this isn't your tent. Um, but rather than leaving, as we might assume would happen, this strange man um, tried to strike up a conversation with Camilla uh, and she felt really unable in, that, in the situation to ask him to leave directly. Uh, and to quote from her, she said, because you never know how that is going to go when you're a girl, uh, end quote. So instead she tried to kind of engage him in just friendly, friendly conversation. Um, so as time progressed, the stranger started attempting to flirt with Camilla and asked her, quote, can I share your sleeping bag because I don't know where to go. Um, so eventually one of her friends did return to the campsite um, and asked the stranger to leave, which, uh, which he did. So in her interview, Camilla really downplayed this situation um, as being potentially dangerous as opposed to um, you know, actually an experience of sexual violence or harassment. Um, and she described it as being potentially dangerous, um, particularly because it was um, relatively early in the night. Um, so although it was dark, um, the campsite was quite deserted because m most of the patrons were at the main stage. Um, it was before the main like headlining act had been on um, for the night. Um, and there were no security or staff around or certainly not visibly patrolling um, the area. Um, so there was a real sense from Camilla that, you know, nothing had actually happened and that she'd avoided um, a potentially dangerous uh, experience. Um, that said, I think it's really important to note that this experience impacted Camilla um, to the point that the next festival that she went to, um, she actually paid quite, uh, quite a, a bit of money to stay in a really exclusive camping area um, because she thought it might be safer and more highly controlled. Um, although unfortunately she also experienced harassment uh, in that particular space. So I think we can see in Camilla's um, experience a range of different factors that are coming together to shape what happened. Um, and we've argued that these factors form a, a complex assemblage. So that is, uh, these contributing factors can't be readily disentangled from one another uh, and that they're folding into or, or co-constituting uh, one another. 
So firstly, and as I just mentioned, we see this um, discursive construction of what counts as, um, as real sexual violence coming into play. Um, so Camilla is really clearly downplaying her experience as not counting, um, you know, to draw on the work of uh, Liz Kelly and Jill Radford, um, she positions it as, you know, nothing actually happened. It was just the potential um, for sexual violence, despite the fact that there was a strange intoxicated man in her tent um, who was sexually harassing her. Uh, so next, I think we see a, a, a range of different environmental and material uh, factors that are coming into play here. Um, so firstly, um, we have this environment where there's um, you know, lots of loud noises, crowding, lighting, um, and, and so forth, um, that created this overwhelming sensory overload for Camilla. Um, and that folded into her, her corporal response where she, um, you know, needed to seek out a, a quiet um, and comparatively isolated um, location. Um, so there's an interaction here between um, the environment and, and Camilla uh, needing to be alone. Um, we also see the, um, the role of the large, disorganized, and very unruly or difficult to manage um, camping grounds. Um, and I think this is particularly the case when, when someone is intoxicated. Um, so these camping spaces often have, you know, thousands and thousands of tents that all look the same. They're very difficult to distinguish between, um, particularly when it's, um, when it's dark outside. Um, you know, in our observations, there was very poor lighting in uh, the campsites uh, at, at Falls Festival. Um, and certainly people accidentally entering the wrong tent um, was raised in other interviews as something that had happened to participants or their friends. Um, and we'd witnessed um, at Falls Festival um, intoxicated patrons who were kind of stumbling around trying to find their own tents. Um, and certainly this is something that I've personally experienced when I was a younger festival goer, um, you know, trying to find my tent quite late at night after perhaps consuming a little bit too much. Um, so these were very disorienting um, spaces. Like I said, this was compounded by the lack of lighting in the space that could make it more difficult to, to navigate, uh, as well as reducing the potential for surveillance from other patrons or festival staff. Um, so I think these um, varied spatial elements were coming together here to um, position this strange man to enter Camilla's tent, you know, either accidentally um, or under the guise of it being uh, an, an accident. Um, so we also see here um, the open and, and porous yet, yet private nature of campsite spaces. Um, so we're drawing on the work of Dilks Frain here, who has described festival campsites in this way um, in their work on drug use at festivals. So what this means is that campsite spaces in a lot of respects are relatively open to other people. So it is quite easy to just you know, wander into another person's campsite. Um, at the same time as being um, quite private and, and secluded spaces, um, particularly inside um, the tent. So Dilk's brain discusses how this facilitates certain um, drug consumption practices at festivals. However, I think in our work, what this open and porous um, you know, nature of these spaces is contributing towards is the potential for sexual violence to occur. Uh, we see this uh, also in the security and surveillance practices. Um, so the fact that this was a time of night where um, there weren't a lot of security around act or other staff members actively uh, monitoring the campsite space um, because the vast majority of um, particip uh, patrons sorry, were in the main festival area meant that Camilla wasn't sure if there was anyone around who she could turn to um, for help um, or that she could quickly get to for assistance. Uh, next, I think we see some of those transgressive and carnivalesque features uh, coming through, especially the consumption of, of alcohol and drugs in this particular uh, example. Um, so firstly, some of these um, practices contributed towards Camilla being alone. Um, you know, her friend who walked her back to her tent wanted to continue to enjoy partying and, you know, participating in, um, in these practices and, you know, taking part of the, the partying and the fun. 
And to be really clear, this isn't to place blame on her friends in, in any way. Uh, rather, it's to illustrate how this aspect of the assemblage um, contributed towards Camilla being isolated. Um, alcohol and drug consumption was also a very clear feature in um, the stranger's action. So again, the disorienting um, effects of alcohol or drugs might have made it more difficult for him to um, locate his tent or to have you know, caused genuine confusion about where he was. Um, alternatively, it might have provided a plausible excuse um, if he had intentionally entered Camilla's tent. You know, sorry, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I think there's an entanglement here between um, the environmental context and this person's inebriated space that is directing his body towards the wrong tent. Uh, and finally, I think we see a range of different gendered norms um, and gendered norms relating specifically to festivals as well that are folding into the actions of both um, Camilla and the stranger who entered her tent. Um, so for example, we see Camilla um, feeling unable to directly um, confront the stranger um, or to tell him to fuck off. So you know, she said she felt she had to be very polite uh, in this context. Uh, and I think that really demonstrates um, the double bind that women often face in trying to navigate uh, men's violence or the potential uh, for men's violence to unfold. Um, so we know that women are often held responsible if their direct response provokes the perpetrator in some way. So, you know, if Camilla had told him to fuck off and he then became aggressive, that she might have been deemed uh, responsible in some way. At the same time, women are also deemed responsible if they're not clearly expressing their boundaries or not clearly articulating um, a no. Uh, and I think this is further complicated by the potential to be seen as um, overreacting, uh, particularly in a situation or an incident like this that can also be framed as, you know, as nothing really, really happening. Um, so again, it ties back to that discursive um, construction and framing of sexual violence. I think for the stranger, um, his actions could relate to the performance of masculinity um, within festival settings. Um, so, for example, his decision to kind of try his luck with Camilla when he'd um, stumbled into the wrong tent uh, might relate to the hedonistic and transgressive construction of festivals as spaces where anything goes and where um, spontaneous hookups are um, present as a possibility. I think there's also uh, homosocial imperatives here, uh, even though his friends weren't directly present um, you know, during this incident. Um, but Camilla certainly speculated that this stranger's actions might have you know, provided good material for a kind of nostalgic and performative um, storytelling to his peers later on. So you know, it kind of provides this um, crazy festival escapade um, to share with an audience of, of male friends about you know, the time he tried to hook up with a, a random woman in, in a tent when he got lost. Um, and certainly this is something that came through in some of our observations when we were at Falls festivals where we overheard um, you know, groups of young men quite loudly recounting stories of supposed um, sexual conquests, whether they were real or um, imaginary. Um, Okay, so I know I'm probably going over time a little bit, but just to draw this together, um, I think that the analysis uh, that we've developed and presented here um, illustrates how a, ra a complex range of material, discursive, human and non-human factors are coming together to facilitate um, sexual violence and that these individual components of these assemblages can't be readily disentangled from one another. Um, so notably, I think the physical environment, such as tents, crowded spaces, uh, norms relating to gender, um, festivals and sexual violence, and alcohol and drug consumption were very common features in participants' experiences, and that these features were folding or intertwining with each other uh, in a way that means that they were mutually constituted and unable to be disentangled um, into their component parts. Um, so we argue in relation to prevention that there's a need to try to transform these spatial and cultural features. So to transform um, the particular assemblages that are able to be formed um, within festival spaces. 
uh, and I'm happy to go into that more in, in question time, but in particular, we're arguing that we need to think about how we can work towards um, developing communities where there's an ethic of care, particularly given that a lot of the features that were contributing um, to these assemblages were either quite difficult to change, particularly in relation to the um, physical environment, um, or that were part of the um, attraction and joy in going to festivals in the first place. Um, so when it comes to things like, you know, moshing in a crowded space or consuming lots of drugs or, or alcohol. Uh, and we ask how we might transform the gendered norms and practices that are actually underpinning this um, sexual violence so that festivals might actually become a truly transgressive space. Um, and I will leave it there and I'd love to, um, yeah, hear any thoughts, reflections or questions that you have. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bianca. That was great. Such an interesting um, paper with such um, rich data. Um, yeah, it was also, I didn't realise there'd be so much, of course I should have thought about it, but so much um, talking about alcohol and other drugs too, which is what um, some of my interests are. Um, I know we've gone up to um, five o'clock, um, so we're kind of at the end of our time, but I'll just quickly see if there's one or two questions and then, um, you know, we might just push it for another five minutes and then we'll close the session. So um, if anyone does have a question, um, please feel free to put it into the chat function. Otherwise, if you raise the hand, your hand, I'll turn your mic on, which might be a little bit nicer. Here we go. I don't know if you can see that, Bianca, but we have a question um, from Michelle saying, um, in your study, did you come across any participants who experienced image-based sexual abuse, such as upskirting or taking of non-consensual consensual images? Um, off the top of my head, no, that wasn't a common uh, experience. Um, but I think it's something that would be interesting to explore more um, it, has, it is something that I've heard in other contexts as being an, an issue. Um, so for example, um, people who go to um, comic conventions in cosplay, having people touch them and um, take non-consensual images of their, their costumes was, is a really common issue. So I do suspect that that is likely also an issue in, um, in festival settings, you know, where people are dressed in particular, um, you know, playful or um, you know, revealing ways. Um, yeah, my suspicion is that it would be an issue, but it didn't come through um, in, yeah, in the experiences that our participants uh, discussed. Does anyone else have a question? Um, I don't know if, yes, there is another one. Um, does, uh, how do you imagine any recommendations from your research to be applied into redesigning festivals for the COVID safe future? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so I think this is a really good question and there is, I'm aware that there's a lot of work going on um, behind the scenes at the moment. Um, so I know the Australian Festival Association is doing some work around developing training. Um, and I think, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about this, so sorry if I'm saying confidential things, but there is also a toolkit being developed in Victoria um, for festivals um, in terms of addressing um, drug and alcohol related risks as well as um, sexual violence and harassment. Um, so look, one of the biggest things I would like to see emphasized, um, well, firstly is the potential for bystander intervention as a strategy for um, creating uh, that kind of community um, of care or like a, an ethics of care between patrons. Um, particularly because um, these incidents were so difficult to respond to, they were so difficult to report or do anything tangible to uh, um, in response to after the fact. Um, so having people who are able to intervene in the moment and provide support or express community just disapproval, I think, is uh, quite a powerful uh, option in some respects, although it does have uh, limitations. Um, I mean, the other really key thing is ensuring that festival staff and volunteers are actually trained um, around what sexual violence is and how to respond to disclosures. Um, I think it's really fair to say that um, some people who had reported had horrendous responses. Um, I think you know, the other thing that's really important, and this is perhaps not um, something that can be achieved by festivals alone, um, but I think working towards developing ethical sexual practices is, is really key here. So transforming how we actually do or negotiate or engage in, in sexual interaction um, in a way that is based on mutuality and consent and, um, and pleasure and, and respect. Um, so 
it's about focusing on focusing on a positive as opposed to telling people you can't do this or you shouldn't do that. It's the question of how do we actually engage in sexual interaction um, in a way that forecloses the possibility for non-consensual non-consensual sexual activity um, to to occur. Um, but like I said, that's probably beyond the remit of, of festivals in and of themselves, although they can certainly have, um, you know, messaging around, um, you know, good sexual practice. Um, and the final thing, sorry, I know that we're so out of, over time, um, and I'm probably dreaming on this because of the political situation, but a, a fundamental change to how we're policing and um, surveilling festivals. So the way that we're policing drug use at the moment is actively causing harm on you know, so many different levels, um, you know, certainly in, in regards to the actual harms of drug use, but also in relation to the ability of patrons to seek support and to report things when they were experiencing sexual violence. Um, so I, I would really like to see us move towards a, a much more um, you know, harm, re harm reduction uh, framework rather than the kind of law and order um, policing practices that we're seeing at the moment. All right, I'm really sorry, but I think we're going to have to um, leave it there. Although you've got a couple of nice comments in the chat. I think you can see just that complimenting on your presentation. So I hope everyone was here. They would join me in a round of applause um, to thank you for coming and presenting at our seminar today. Thanks so much. That was really fascinating. Um, yeah, and I'll look forward to reading. Is there a publication out? Yeah, we've got a few out. So there is one in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Criminology and a couple of book chapters. Please feel very free to email me if you didn't get to um, ask questions or if you want a copy of our publications, I'm happy to send them through. So great, yeah, please get in touch. <laughs> thanks, Bianca. And thanks, everyone, um, for joining us. Uh, yes. All right. Um, everyone have a good Wednesday evening and I'll see you at next month's seminar if you'd like to join us. Bye.